health. Our top source of vitality and our number one prep. Preppers tend to get a bit gear heavy. At least the majority of the people that I've met over the years. And I've been guilty of this myself. Getting knee deep into gadgets and gear of all different types. Many things that are out there for preparedness are not necessary to preparedness. And you might have found some things over the years that might be interesting and be helpful on some level. Uh, But preparedness is really not that complicated. There's not that many things that you really need to have. There's a few tools that's really nice to have. And you can make an argument that there are a few things that are borderline essential. Uh, But besides and beyond that, it's just kind of debatable about how much do you really need. And certainly, you know, do you really need an excess of this, this, and that? And in a lot of cases, it's, it's not. Now, there are some categories that it just feels much more comfortable to have a lot more than not such as water and food, maybe it has something to do with clothing or maybe batteries or maybe it's just redundancy in systems. So there, there are some cases to be made. But when it comes to health, it's just a topic that you do not hear a lot about in the preparedness community. You hear a little bit about it, about conditioning and getting your body a bit more able to handle stress, but you don't see the obsession about health in the prepper world like you see preppers get obsessed with various types of gear. Some preppers I've met are obsessed with firearms. Some preppers are really obsessed with blades. Others are obsessed with lights Others are really into a certain genre like camping or backpacking or hiking or caving or whatever, you know, and there's typically things that they really focus on. Uh, Some preppers are a bit more like survivalists. They just want to live off the land. And then there's other people who are more like pack rats. And I mean, it's just everybody's a bit different. And what I've noticed is that over the years, it seems like more and more people kind of are moving into homesteading, which is great, uh, but that seems to be kind of the current trend. But if we step back from all of that, we still have the underlying foundational need to be healthy to do any of it. We need our health to do anything. It's our number one prep by far. You're not going to be very functional. You're not going to be flexible or adaptable when you don't feel well or when you physically can't do anything because you're not well. So I just want to focus on some things that seem to be very common sense, but very few people really apply these things in their life. And so I'm going to run through a few categories here of what I I would say that these are within the realm of health and just give you my two cents about how I've uh, seen this over the years. And so first is sleep. You know, I've noticed that a lot of my life I've been sleep deprived. Truly, I have not been sleeping enough. And, you know, it, it seems like, oh, once I get going in the morning, I'm okay for a while. Even though I've only gotten five hours of sleep, it seems like it's not a big deal until like midday and then I'm getting really tired and then of course I'm starting to doze toward the end of the day and I've realized though when I have enough sleep I really don't act like that and so I've been doing a deeper dive into the history of sleep and just what uh, just cultures in, in an aggregate sense like what does the average person globally need or tend to get when they're functioning at a very high level, what what kind of sleep time are we talking about? And what are the conditions? And so it looks like that the average person on the planet needs between seven to eight hours of sleep. And this even includes the studies that I've looked into, the people living in the jungles, 
uh, third world countries, just people like living very primitive. They're averaging more toward the seven hours, but sometimes as much as eight. And then you see, of course, people in first world countries, uh, they're getting between six to nine. There's a there's a range there. Uh, but it looks like that a lot more people, though, in first world countries, they need more closer to eight. It could be that because they have more stress than someone that lives in a very, very primitive way. Uh, it's just a theory of mine. Uh, but yeah, basically, though, it's between seven to eight hours is the average for the average person of need for sleep. And these people do better when their sleep environment is slightly on the cool side. It's a quiet, safe environment, which, I mean, obviously that goes with common sense, uh, but it needs to be said. And that it's a dark environment. You know, we're not like wired to sleep in the middle of the day. And so it's one of those things that it's good to have quiet, cool, dark environment to sleep. And, and that's where you get the, the most, you know, productive sleep. You, you get the best rest. And you can, uh, I guess for the lack of a better word here, I'm trying to think of like, uh, you can rebuild maybe. That's a good way to say it. Uh, from a whole day of labor, you can recuperate. Uh, that's a good word. Uh, but yeah, you, we all need sleep. And to pretend that, oh, I can just take some energy drinks and then I'll be able to rebound tomorrow and I, I don't need that much sleep. That's really a misleading thing to tell yourself. That's really not true. Uh, the next is relaxation. I think a lot of us are not very relaxed. And so I think this kind of comes into the point of that we're a lot of times either focused on the past or on the future. And this brings about a level of anxiety. Plus, a lot of people just don't know how to relax or they're not doing things to actually manage their stress load. And so I think a better way to deal with this is to do things that are enjoyable and relaxing, of course, and then be more present minded. And that really kind of keeps us in the moment. And when you're in the moment, you're more centered and focused on what you're doing. And you tend to do those things better when you're in the moment. And, you know, this dovetails into stress management, you know, having a balanced lifestyle, having good habits, you know, formulating, uh, you know, a history of good decision making, not being too quick to jump into something. I know a lot of people kind of make decisions really quickly and they don't think them through and then they have problems. And so maybe you shouldn't do that. But yeah, just be careful, though, that and, and know that it's just part of the human condition that the more questions that we answer, the more solutions that we develop in a day, the lower the quality of those solutions, typically speaking. So if you have a day that you have 10 questions that you're trying to find solutions to, you're going to probably do a lot better with those solutions than if you had 20 questions that you're trying to come up with 20 solutions. And so try your best to minimize the load on yourself so that you can be more efficient in the moment. And so you're not, you know, stretching yourself out too thin. Uh, exercise and movement. I think that basically having a good foundation uh, and, and habits of movement and, and being okay with doing things and pushing yourself and having confidence uh, that you can be stronger and faster and is going to be something that is going to be very beneficial. And to be around people who are active, you know, exercise and movement, these things help to break down and burn off stress hormones. And it keeps our organs, you know, working more efficiently. And that's been shown over and over in studies. Uh, the same thing about relationships, our social interactions, our social life is very important, not only to our mental health, uh, but to how we perceive the world. You know, there's a lot of perceptions that are involved. And so if you have a whole history of negative relationships, you might really see the world in a lot more negative way because you may not trust people. You may not see opportunities when they pop up in front of you, you're, you're going to really limit yourself. So having good balanced relationships, relationships with good boundaries. And there are times that 
people are just do not work out, you know, and it's not healthy, you know, to be around them. There are people who are toxic. And so just learn to identify who those people are. And when you have to say enough's enough and move on, you have the means to do it. And you can't take it personal because these people are what the way they are. And they're going to probably continue to be regardless of what you say and do. And you have to actually take care of yourself. You have a responsibility to do what's balanced. And so you have to do the things that actually make sense in the real world and not just pretend that, oh, I should just go along with this madness because it's just the easiest thing in the moment. Sometimes we have to do things that are not easy. Uh, The next is finances. I mean, I think this goes without saying that finances are a big issue in the modern day world. Everybody has seemingly money issues, or at least most people do. It could be debt or it could just be that they're not making enough to to reach their so-called lifestyle uh, standards or there's always something going on. Things break. You know, it could be an automobile that you have that needs to be repaired or there's home repairs or maybe you just don't have enough to save for retirement. There's always something. And, And I think it's really good to step back and to make sure you prioritize whatever income and resources you have coming in to prioritize where they're going to be used. And there's nothing wrong with getting professional advice and help from the outside to doing research on how do other people that are successful, how have they done it? Now, this next one is really one of my favorites. I think it's probably one of the most important that directly correlates to health, overall health and well-being, and that is diet. Diet is huge. And so it goes without saying you know, there's a lot of dangers in the so-called standard American diet. I mean, just look around. If you need some evidence, just look at the average American and see how out of shape they are, how obese they are, all their health conditions, that the average American are, is on quite a few prescription drugs. And you're like, wow, I wonder why all this is. Well, they're very much compromised. Well, how did that happen? It's probably because most of it has to do with the junk food the hyper-processed foods, the synthetic foods that are being consumed. And so we also have to be careful about supplements. There's a lot of synthetic supplements out there that are not really good for us. Um, And so, you know, look at diet as something that is critical. So I would eat clean, as clean as you can, and do research and find what works for you. What works for me is the carnivore diet. That's just what works for me. Uh, I don't know what works for you. You know, you have to find that out. But I noticed that when I stopped eating fruits and vegetables and eating more uh, animal products, I just feel better and better and better. And I feel great now. I feel really, really good. And so everybody has to find what works for them. And I do still supplement on some nutrients. I don't probably need to because my diet is complete and it's great. But sometimes I still take a little bit of vitamin D and some nitric oxide and a few other things just to make sure that I have as much as I need. Another topic within health is going to be goals. Now, goals are, it, you know, it, it's, it's a big it's a big topic. You know, it's a, it's a topic right there. It should get, it can get its own video, but I'm just going to condense it down to you got to have something to move toward. Right. And you need a plan of action to get there. And so goals is something that kind of um, gives you direction. Without goals, you're kind of just blowing in the wind. Right. I mean, you really are not oriented very well, if at all. And so goals give you some direction, if not clear, clear direction. That's why I like goals that are very you know specific and precise. So you have really good direction. Uh, But There's a lot of nuance within goals. There's like short-term goals, medium-term goals, long-term goals. And I think you should probably have a few of each. I don't think that it's the best thing, though, for most people to have a whole bunch of each, like to have 10 short-term goals, 10 medium goals, and 10 long-term goals. It's, It's kind of overwhelming. Now, you can still have them, I guess, if you wanted to, and you could write it all down, and you can prioritize which one you do first. But what I've personally have noticed, it's a lot more manageable psychologically, if you will, 
just the mental aspect of it is when you just have maybe a couple of each. That's a lot more digestible. And of course, once you get done with one, you can replace it with another one. And you can always update the list. But goals are awesome. I just wouldn't be obsessed with your goals. And that's all that you think about. Uh, I would have a, a variety of things that you do throughout the day. But I think it's great to have goals written down and thought through with a real plan, with a real calendar date that's associated with those goals. And those goals are so detailed that you know what you need to do to do them and that you're doing them. Okay, so the next is going to be forward movement. This kind of really dovetails with goals, but it's it's that foundational motivation and that group of cheerleaders, if you will, that you have, you know, your friend network, your family network, those people that mean things, something to you. These, these people and these forces are behind you and help and propel you. And this is in addition to the level of respect that you have for yourself to move you forward, forward movement. And so it, it, this is bolstered, though, when you have good, positive, reinforced habits and when you have perspectives that are rooted in reality, you know, not some skewed perspective of how something works, but how something actually works. When you're honest with yourself, you have true perspective. And so this lends greatly to opportunities. Forward moving people are looking for opportunities because they um, are okay with that potential for success. Uh, people who are moving in the reverse orientation are not looking for opportunities. Uh, they're basically looking for problems or they're reliving their past or they're just so lost in the future that hasn't even happened and probably won't happen in the way that they think it's going to happen that it's causing a big mess for them. And so this kind of goes back to, you know, being present minded and being just honest with how things are and having good formations of support networks and just understanding how to look and perceive at things because opportunities exist all around us all the time. Positive opportunities are not in short supply. It's just identifying those opportunities. That's the hardest part of all this. And a lot of it just has to do with reorienting your perspective so that you can see it for once instead of constantly walking right by it and being blind to the obvious. I think it's also really important to review and to have good planning and to have good organization and to understand the pros and cons of things before you do it as well. So when possible, it's good to take the time to weigh what it is that you're about to do. If it has really almost any type of importance, if it, if it, if it can really change the course of your life or other person's lives, other people's lives, uh, then you really should probably take a moment and go, okay, is, is this something that, I, that has worked in the past? Um, if it has, how did I do it? Um, and then to look at the best way to plan forward and to organize the priorities within the planning and to look at the pros and cons in the sense of, okay, uh, if I do this, then these things are going to happen. But if I do this, these other things that may not be so desirable might happen. What is going to be, you know, what's the, what's the offset here? Is it, is it going to be more pro or more con? And you're going to have to figure out, or maybe there's something that to do with the cons that like maybe one of the cons is so bad that you just can't do it because of that alone. Or maybe one of the pros is so good that it just completely outshines every con added up together. And so you'll pretty much know it when you have it all written out in front of you and you can look at it concretely. And that's a great habit to get into is to write things down and make it real, put it on paper, say it out loud, tell another person and get it out there and see what comes back. Uh, sometimes within a few minutes of projecting your intentions, you'll see the repercussions and if it's going to be good, bad or indifferent. 
Uh, and lastly, I just want to say that we all have a place of inner peace. We all have peace in us. And it's up to us about how much we want to tap into that, how much we want to interact and be peaceful. Uh, you know, the world is full of chaos, but it doesn't mean that we have to be full of chaos inside of ourselves. And so this is a great place to go in our place of peace to gain insight, uh, awareness, uh, wisdom, um, and of course, just uh, solitude, you know, and, and to feel actual peace and to tap into our inherent level of happiness that's always there. And this is just a, the thing that a lot of people ignore, that they have this inner place that's always there, always available. It's just rarely used. So how do you see health? Do you see it as your number one prep? Thanks for watching.